I'm so thankful, so, so thankful, because I believe we were created for communion. I believe that the entirety of our life hinges on our communion, our connection, our oneness with God. And, um, and so I'm so, so, so very thankful to be in an atmosphere where the Lord is honored in such a way where we know his presence is, is in our midst. Amen. Um, I do want to reiterate what was said with our building committee. Um, you know, we, we're doing a lot right now. We're putting in sinks. We're putting in urinals. We're, we're uh, laying flooring. We're laying carpet. We're, we're, you know, we're building sound booths, like, like uh, Brother Brian said, vestibules, uh, painting walls. Um, it's just a lot to do. It's a whole lot to do. We want to be in by August 1st. We want to be in by the first Sunday in August. So we got one week. And so with that being said, it can be done, but we need everybody to step up and do it. Amen. We need everybody to, to put your hands on it um, and to come out um, and to, to be a part of what we're trying to get accomplished um, there. And so I say it like this. It's better to have more than what you need than to have less than what you need. So it, it's, it's better if you're there and you're not needed for you to not be there and, and to be needed. Amen. And so find yourself present. Um, that's everybody in Florence. Find yourself present over the next seven days. We want to get in there in the next seven days. Everybody say seven days. Seven days. We got we got seven more days. And there's people that are putting in work around the clock. Um, brother, um, brother Brian, he stayed. I mean, can we give him a hand clap? He don't, he don't really know all that he's doing. But I know all that he's doing. He, he stayed to 11 yesterday. Um, you know, pretty much him and, and Shelby, uh, Brother Shelby, by themselves, yeah. trying to tighten things up and get the platform together. Got back up this morning and went back this morning and worked until an hour before service. Then went home, changed, got in his clothes, and then was in position to serve and not saying a word. Amen. And so, you know, I love that, those types of examples because what it does is it kind of confronts us. All right. Now, now, my excuse was this, 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 and this. But this, you know, when you have examples like that that are help leading the charge, then, then I think that we, we need to make sure that we're accountable. Amen. And that we, we step up. We need you to be there. You know, we're excited about the building. We need you to be there. We need you to show up and show your excitement by when you're tired, when you don't feel like doing nothing else, that you'll come out there and you'll do what, what's necessary for us to get, get where we need to be. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm going to reiterate that again um, because I, I need you to understand the importance of your presence. Um, they are everybody. Um, so we bless the Lord for that. On another note, I kind of sense today the Lord was begin to speak to me. Um, I'm reminded of the epistle that Peter wrote, and he's writing to a crowd of individuals that he's raised up in the faith because he knows he does not have much more time. Um, and so he, he says, I'm writing this to put you in remembrance. There's certain things that Peter had already laid in their hearts, certain things that he had already talked to them. But he said, I'm writing this to put you in remembrance of those things which have now been imparted into your heart that you might be stirred up. That, that, that he, he talks about being stirred up. See, many times what happens, there are truths and realities and that there's graces that have been imparted into us by the word. But if there is, we, we tend to forget them and they settle down. It's almost like when you try to stir a drink that, that starts with powder, it has a contents to it. And if you don't stir it enough, the, the, a, a lot of the contents will settle down to the bottom. And when you drink it, you won't really have everything that's actually in that container you won't be experiencing it although it's in there it hasn't been stirred up enough for you to experience all the content you know we don't cool we say kool-aid uh, it hasn't been stirred up enough so when you drink it, it it tastes watery although there's more flavoring in there but it necessitates being stirred up i believe that there's some stuff that's inside of us that we're not experiencing um that need to be stirred up um, that there, there has to be a remembrance of some of these things um, that, that we don't need to necessarily get. They're sitting there. We just need them stirred up. Amen. And, and with that being said, 
I want to kind of stir up your remembrance on what I believe is the, the linking, the linchpin reality to walking with God. Worship. I, I want to stir up your remembrance concerning some things about worship. Now please understand when we talk about worship, the Bible says it like this. God says, I, I would desire obedience over sacrifice. Yes. Worship at its core is obedience unto God. Amen? It is when Jesus died on the cross, that was an act of worship. That was an act of worship unto God. The first time that the Bible mentions worship is in Genesis 22 when Abraham has taken Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him. That was worship. He was obeying God in giving something he didn't really want to give. Abraham did not want to sacrifice his son, but the sacrifice of his son was an act of worship. And what is worship? Obedience. Not obedience to what we agree with, but obedience to what he says. God says, I would desire obedience over sacrifice. Now, we understand we, we ain't got no business bringing no chickens in, up in here killing them to give sacrifice. Amen. We're not killing livestock. But, but we give the sacrifice of praise. We give the fruit of our lips. But you know what? God says, I would rather have obedience over what? Sacrifice. But we give the sacrifice of praise. So what we must understand and what I'm going to stir up our remembrance is, is to understand that ultimately our sacrifice is only as good as it brings us into obedience. Amen, amen. See, when we're singing, you know what happens? Our heart begins to melt and become more moldable to obey God. When we're, when we're praying, our mind begins to shift. And, 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 and things that exalt themselves and said, I don't want to do that and I don't want to do this. But as we're praying, amen, and we're giving that sacrifice, God begins to give us grace to renew our mind and bring us into a greater measure of obedience. Ultimately, everything we do is to bring us into obedience unto God. That's worship. And so I'm going to go back here and I'm, I'm going to review some things that we've, we've talked about, but I, I feel this important. John chapter 4, verse number 23. Very familiar verse is the woman at the well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. I'm just going to read those two. It says, this is Jesus speaking. We're familiar with the text. But the hour cometh. Everybody say hour. hour. And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 24. God is spirit. It says a spirit, but it actually should read God is the spirit. He isn't one of many. He's the. Amen. And all the other spirits are subservient. Yeah. Amen. God is the spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth I tell you what let me read verse 21 too because he talks about the hour again verse number 21 Jesus saith unto her woman believe me the hour cometh everybody say hour, hour. when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the father you worship you know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. I'm going to read verse 23 again. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers 
shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Father, we thank you and we bless you right now for the power of your word, the power of your presence that makes the word come alive in our hearts and causes us to walk away as new men and new women with new minds and new desires and new focuses and new graces and new favors on our life. Lord God, we just thank you that there's truth that is being released in our midst even on today. Lord God, that shall cause us to leave here saying, surely goodness and mercy is following me and shall continue to all the days of our life. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to start by reading a quote. Um, and this quote is, is, is such a powerful quote. Um, and, I, and I pray that I've shared it with you before, but I want to share it with you again. Um, it's a quote by Dutch Sheets. He says this. He says, God is seeking worshipers, not worship. God longs for the singer, not the song. Our heart as a worshiper is what makes our singing worship. God is seeking worshipers, not worship. For the hour coming where the Father seeketh the worshiper that shall worship him. God longs for the singer, not the song. Our heart as a worshiper is what makes our singing worship. Jesus makes it very, very clear that at this well, as he's interacting with this woman, that he is an announcing a new era of worship. A worship that had never been seen in Israel. He now is making that announcement at that well with this woman. He's, he's helping this woman and he's helping us understand through interacting with this woman that his coming was the announcement that there was a new dimension of worship available. Amen. That there was a, a, a dimension of worship that had never been available before. He showed up and he came. And, and that word, he says, this is the hour. He says, this is the hour and it's coming, but now is because I'm here when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Amen. And, and what he was saying was, and the Father's seeking somebody to worship me like that. And now, because I'm here, that's finally possible. Before you worship with animals and blood, before you, you, you worshiped with ritual and routine, but, but now the hour is coming that, that you can now actually worship the Father like he wants to. It was not possible. It was not possible outside of those who entered into a deep revelation of worship like a David. It was not possible to worship in spirit and in truth. Amen? What does that mean? And, and, and that's what I want to deal with. And that's what I want to stir up your remembrance is. In, in, in worship in spirit and worship in truth. What is in spirit and what is in truth? Amen. What is in spirit and what is in truth? It is literally a sequence of access. It is a sequence of entering into one thing to ultimately enter into another thing. It is a sequence of accessing one thing ultimately to access another thing. When we, what, what Jesus is saying is when we worship inside of spirit, it actually brings us inside of truth. Worshiping in spirit is a means of access inside of truth. Everybody say sequence of access. Everything we enter into has a sequence of access. In other words, when we go to our house, usually we enter into the foyer. Come on. We enter into the vestibule, whatever we want to call it, before we enter in, or we can say it this way. We enter into the porch before we enter into the house. There was a, it was now me getting into the porch that actually gave me an opportunity to get into the house. If I never get into the porch, 
I will not be able to access the inside of the house. It is a sequence of access. What God is saying is in spirit and in truth is a sequence of access. When I worship in spirit, it actually, that's the front porch to get me inside of truth. Amen. It is now the way and the means for which we move into truth. So, so that, that's the first thing I want to, to make sure that we remember. When we worship inside of spirit, it brings us inside of truth. And the more we worship in spirit, the more truth we can move into. Now, he starts out that dialogue by saying, I'm telling you right now, the hour is coming when you're not going to worship at a mountain, nor you're going to worship at Jacob's well, but your worship is going to be spirit. It's going to be pneuma. It's going to be like the wind. It's not going to be confined to a locale. It doesn't matter if it's a good day or a bad day. It doesn't matter if you're doing good or you're doing bad. It doesn't matter if what you're trying to do is working or what you're trying to do is not working. It doesn't matter if, 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 if doors are opening or if they're closing. This worship will not not be dictated by physical location nor will it be dictated by a desire for success but it'll be worship in spirit and worship in truth it will not be confined to a mountain it will not be confined to a valley it will not be confined to a good place or a bad place it's spirit and he said when you get inside of worship in spirit then it gives you access to get inside of truth now what is truth what is truth? According to John 17, his word is truth. Thy word is truth. Inside of spirit gets me inside of truth. See, what we must understand about truth was the Father's intention was never for us just to hear truth, but actually to move into truth just like we move into a house. Truth is not just information. Truth is actually a place. Truth is actually a position that I can access. So every different truth, this is what we got to understand. Every different truth I hear is a different place I'm, me and you are designed to move into by way of worship in spirit. It's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to move into it. Glory be to God. No weapon formed against me is able to prosper. You you can quote it but have you moved into it see th this is where we gotta this is where the rubber meets the road and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding shall guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus you can hear it but how many people have moved into it glory be to God and, and, and so we have all these things that you, with the head and not the tail and in my name we shall lay our hands on the sick and, and they shall recover and, and we cast out devils all these are truths they're not just information they're Places. How do we get into them? How, glory be to God. How do we begin to experience them? How do we begin to operate in them? Why can't we just say them and they happen? Anybody ever tried to, to, to run a truth by God? Anybody tried to proclaim something and you realize that you could not function experientially in that truth? I hope I'm not the only one that's willing to admit that I tried it. I, I hollered it. I, I ran around the living room with it. And at the end of the day, I did not experience it. I believe is because we have now overlooked the sequence of access. There's a sequence of access to not only hear that truth but get into that truth called worship in spirit that gives me access to worship inside of truth. In other words, if I'm ever going to get in laying hands on the sick and they recover, it's going to call for, cause for me to enter into a dimension of worship. Glory be to God. If I'm going to enter into being the head and not the tail, that's a dimension of worship that I must enter into. That's why God is spending so much time taking limits off of our worship and taking borders off of our worship. See, that's why consecration is so very important because these are the opportunities to worship in spirit. Why? Because we're weak. Because we're hungry. Because we're tired. Because we don't feel like it. And this is actually the opportunity to get in the spirit. To get in a place where we can begin to worship outside of feeling. Outside of, out of strength. Our own strength. Outside of understanding. And just worship God in spirit. I, I'm tired and, and my stomach is growling and, 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 and literally I don't feel the best, but the God is here. And I'm 
going to get in the spirit because I understand that this is an opportunity for me not to rely on a well, not to rely on a mountain, not to rely on feeling good, but actually to worship inside of spirit so I can actually gain access to inside of truth. We're here in this place right now that we're in because God wants to give us access to another level of truth. But so many times we back up because we don't understand in spirit doesn't mean in feelings. In spirit doesn't mean in my routine. In spirit doesn't mean during my schedule. In spirit doesn't mean during my devotional time in the morning. See, what God wants to do is he wants to bring us to a place where we can tap in no matter where we are. And I'm going to show you why in a minute. Amen. See, the truth is we never grow weary in well-doing. Y'all know that, right? The truth is we have peace that passes all understanding. That's the truth. How do I get in it? How do I get in that? I worship the God that gave it to me. I bless him when I feel like it, when I don't. I'll drag myself up at 5 a.m. Glory be to God. And don't even feel like being up right now. And I'll go and I'll worship in spirit. Amen. Amen. So many times we hear those verses and we say, you know what? I know, I know. And then, you know what we do after that? But. I know, I know we, that we don't grow weary and well doing. I know, I know we got peace that all, that's all understanding. But. Right, right. Why? Because we haven't moved in. And so we have information, but we don't have experience. We have an academic knowledge of something that we don't know. We've learned what we don't know. Learning is dangerous if you don't plan knowing it. It's dangerous to learn stuff you don't plan knowing. It's dangerous to memorize scriptures like pray without ceasing unless you want to know how to do that. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? It's, it's dangerous to, to want to quote a whole bunch of scriptures that you don't actually want to enter into the posture of worship for which you know those script. You know them not academically, but experientially. Amen. Worship in spirit. We worship inside of spirit, which brings us inside of truth. Worship is not just supposed to be an experience, but an act of taking residence. When we worship, we're taking residence in places. When we lift our hands together and, and, and begin to cry out Yahweh, it's an act of taking residence into truths that may have been sitting on the inside of us, but we had never known. Glory be to God, when we're lifting our hands and see, when there's high worship like it broke out uh, um, just a moment ago when Marcus was singing and he began to talk about you being the cause and, and, and he began to talk about Abba Father, there was an opportunity to take residence in that and, and, and there was an opportunity that truths that have been hanging over our heads and truths that we've heard that we haven't seen yet that worship if we just get in that when we recognize that that's in the room and we get into that it's an opportunity to take residence in some stuff amen, amen. so now, now watch this I'll say this much, whatever we call worship that doesn't give us access to take residence in truth isn't worship the Father has made available to us. It might be worship, but we are, we are living beneath what's available. Amen. I, when we're worshiping, we, when, when worship is over, I should be freer. When worship is over, I should be stronger. When worship is over, my mind shouldn't be racing anymore. That there's something that I have grace to take residence in. When worship is over, that sin should have stopped. When worship is over, the drinking, the, the, the addiction to alcohol is broken. When worship is over, it gives us grace to take residence in something. It's not just an experience, it's an entrance. Worship is not just an experience. And if we uh, approach worship as an experience and not an entrance, we'll wind up leaving out of worship the same way we came into worship. And then worship will begin to be treated like religion. I'm just lifting my hands because I'm supposed to. Now, don't get me wrong. I start that way. I do it because God told me to. But if I'm giving, if I'm going in worship in spirit, 
and I'm glory be to God. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to eat when I leave church. I'm not thinking about who's worshiping and who's not, but I'm giving all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength into this worship. At some point, when I open my eyes back up, there are some things and chains that were on me that will not be on me anymore. There are some ideologies that I fought with that I will not fight with anymore. There is liberties that I access. The preacher didn't preach. They did not give an altar call. All I know is there was worship in the room that came in like spirit, and I entered into that truth before anybody ever preached. It's worship inside us. You can get free in your kitchen. He said it ain't at a, a well. It ain't at no mountain. You don't need to be at, in front of a pastor. You don't need to be in front of an apostle. Get in the spirit while you're washing dishes. And by the time you finish with the cups, you'll be free. Get in the spirit while you sweep in the floor. And by the time it's mopped, you'll enter into a greater place of fruit. It's worship inside of spirit. Which brings us inside of truth. Because we treated worship like an experience instead of an entrance, we wind up leaving worship worrying the same way after worship as we did before worship. We wind up committing the same sins after worship as we did while we, before we worship. We wind up battling the same stuff after worship as we did before we worship. And worship loses its virtue. Worship loses its glory. Worship, it, it turns into something, a coping mechanism. I listen to that because that makes me feel better when I'm down. There's a worship that will take you to a place where you'll never go down like that again. I don't want to listen to that when I get down. I want to listen to something and get into something where I don't go down like that anymore. Amen. But, but it's not an experience. But that's what we understand. It's not an experience. It's an entrance. True worship inside of spirit always brings us inside of truth. If we're not taking residence inside of truth by way of our worship, then we now have to, to begin to revise our worship and begin to understand the importance of getting inside of spirit. That's so hard, especially when you're serving in church, especially when you have responsibilities and you got other issues at home getting inside of spirit. But, 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 but man, our worship is supposed to be giving us grace to take residence in some things. I'll say this much. There's one word that can sum up worship in spirit. You know what that word is? Seeking. Everybody say seeking. Seek Those that worship him in spirit, seek him. Glory be to God. Those that worship him outside of spirit, seek other things in real, not in real life, but acknowledge him in religious settings. See, we've lost the, 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 the definition of seek because we are boxing into what we do in church. And as long as I go all out in church, I'm seeking God. But it's actually what we do outside of this, 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 this surrounding and controlled environment to a degree that dictates whether or not that we're seeking God. Why do we seek Him? Amen. And I, and I talked about this before. Just a little side note. We seek Him. We seek Him. We see King. We see the King. See king we seek him to see him because he can't be seen with the natural eye he can only be seen with the eyes of the heart now worship in spirit allows us to take residential ownership in truth because we're seekers of him glory be to god we don't just no 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 we don't just experience peace when certain things come in the room we move in we don't just experience joy when certain songs are played. We move in. We don't just experience freedom when we hear certain things or when certain people preach. We move in. What happens to everybody else? What happens when we don't understand that worship is a key that unlocks the door to move into truth and take residential ownership? 
I believe it can be best summed up in Psalms chapter 4, verse number 2. I want you to go there. Psalm chapter 4, verse number 2. It says here, O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Remember, we're talking about seeking. I'm going to read that last part again. How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Who or what we're seeking dictates whether or not we're owning or leasing. I want to talk about leasing. Amen. That word leasing, it, it comes from um, a, 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 a Hebrew word that means falsehood or a deceptive thing or to be in vain. What, what God is saying is whatever we're seeking outside of him causes whatever good we're experiencing to be under lease. I, I don't know what's happening in your life right now. So to the degree we're not seeking him, we can't own good, we can only lease it. Ownership is only for those who worship him in spirit. So, so if, if me and you are in a good place right now, but we're not seeking God, guess what? We're just leasing. We're just leasing that good place. We're not going to stay there. If me and you are, 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 are having joy right now, but we're not seeking God, we're leasing joy. That's just under lease. It might be a six-month lease. It might be a 12-month lease. It might be a three-week lease. It might be a two-week lease. But we're not going to stay there. If me and you are, are walking in victory right now, but we're not seeking God, we're leasing that victory. Most of us as believers, and this is where we got to shift, we don't understand that seeking, we don't seek him to find him. We, do, we seek him to keep finding him. You don't find God once. He's too big to be in one spot. You seek him to find him, and then you seek him to find him again. And you seek him to find him again. And you say, and if me and you found God every day for the rest of our lives, we wouldn't have to found half of him. He's just that big. So seeking now is a purpose of life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And I will start adding what other folks are giving effort for. Why? Because I now created you to seek me. That's your life source. So I will give you as an addition what everybody else is going out trying to earn. Because you seek me. Amen? If our marriage is in a good place right now. If we're married, if we're not, if we don't understand that our, we're called as a life seekers, then we're leasing that place. Whether we lease or whether we own hinges on who and what we're seeking. Come on, if you're in here right now and you want to stop leasing peace, I'm here to tell you right now, there's only one answer. Begin to seek your God. If you're tired, if you want to, if you're in here and you're tired of, and you're just, you're tired of uh, um, just leasing victory, uh, begin to seek your God. Watch this. Go, go with me to Second Chronicles, chapter number fifteen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Second Chronicles chapter 15, verse number 1. Thank you, Lord. The Bible reads this, And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, everybody say seek. seek. He will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season, Israel had been without the true God. Remember we talked about in spirit and in truth? And without a teaching priest and without the law. 
But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to them, to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of all the countries. Did y'all see that right there? God is saying, look, it was a time simply because you had a people who was not seeking God that nobody had peace going in and going out. Nobody had peace on their jobs. Nobody had peace in their lives. Nobody had peace in their families. Nobody had peace in their homes. And he said that the core of that issue is the fact that there were a people that were not seeking God. Amen? The, the Bible says that the people of God Ain't the people out there. It says the people of God had been without the true God for a long time. What does church look like when it's done without the true God? What do we do if God ain't here? Hallelujah. I know a preacher said, literally he said, one preacher said 90, he said a church could be completely run without depending on the Holy Spirit at all. He said the Holy Spirit don't have to show up to even run church anymore. Amen. In other words, it looks like program. Yes, yes. It looks like going through all the motions, hitting every point on the bulletin, hitting every point in the program, yet nobody leaving with the power of God on their life. Yet nobody leaving with a changed heart or a renewed mind. Yet nobody leaving with a desire for God and a thirst for righteousness. Amen? Because now we have a service with people who are not seekers. So the preacher really only looks at the Bible Saturday night. Amen. The deacons only study for their class. They they get that they, they only study the curriculum for their class to teach it. They, you, you know, the, the prayer warriors only pray during their prayer day. Nobody's really seeking God outside of their responsibility. Amen. The Bible, they were not worshipers of God in spirit therefore their religion wasn't moving them into truth they were going in and out with no peace they were going in and out with no vexation they were going in and out constantly struggling god when are you going to bring me through this god if you can get me through this week god if you can get me through that day that is not the reflection of a believer that is a reflection of somebody who is not seeking god Amen. You don't struggle that much every week when you're seeking God. You don't wonder if you're going to get through the day when you're seeking God. You wake up understanding this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice. It might not be the best day, but guess what? Best days don't dictate my worship. I worship in spirit. It might not be a good day, but good days don't dictate my I worship in spirit. There is no wonder if I'm going to make it through this day. There is no wondering if we're going to lose it. There is no wondering if this is going to be okay. Amen? Amen. They were without the true God. Evidenced by the fact that they had no permission to actually live in truth. Amen? Notice this relationship. Notice the relationship between without the true God and without a teaching priest. Oh Said so they were without, if, if, if you look back at that scripture, it says in verse number three, now for a long season Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest. Please hear me and hear me well. Without teaching, men will be without the true God. Where, where there is the absence of the presence of true apostolic teaching, there is the absence of a means by which to walk with the true and living God because to walk with the true and living God is by way of moving inside of truths that we're exposed to and teachers expose us to those truths teachers expose us to truths that as we move into those truths we walk with the true and living God why do you get access to truth because every truth I move into gives me the ability to walk closer and in a greater degree with the true and living God we're hearing truth to move into it so we can walk with the God who is is true Amen. only to the degree we've moved into peace can we walk with the God who is peace 
We can't walk with the God who is peace outside of peace ourselves. There must be a moving in. Hallelujah. I want to go back to verse number four. Verse number four says, and this is the tragedy and this is what happens in our day. But when, when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was what? They needed trouble to seek him because they didn't have a teacher to teach them. A lot of people actually believe that trouble is actually necessary for God to teach us. That if we don't have trouble, well, you see what's happening? That's God trying to tell us something. And because we actually think God wants to move us into the truth through trouble instead of teaching. But faith comes by and hear not by trouble. Amen. It took tragedy for them to seek God because they had been so long a time without the true God. They got used to managing life without him instead of the abundant life with him. God doesn't want everybody on their knees because it's a tragedy. Amen. We begin to look at the news and, and we'll see nurses on top of buildings at hospitals lifting their hands and say, oh, look, God is giving glory. He does not want nurses on the top of buildings. Glory be to God because but the pandemic is out and doctors falling on their knees in hospitals because oh look God is getting glory no no that's not worship in spirit that's worship in trouble that, that is not it took now trouble for them to turn to the Lord God of Israel glory be to God no 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 God, that ain't the glory God is looking for God is looking for somebody that will fall down on their knees in worship that looks like they're about to die and ain't nobody about to die that in worship that looks like I, I don't even know where my my next meal is going to come from and I got a refrigerator full of food because my worship has nothing to do with trouble and has everything to do with hearing a word that I responded to. See, when the word grabs a hold of your heart, oh God, for real, you can enter into a desperate worship without desperate situations. See, you, I worship God every single day. Like, I don't even know. How do I... How do I put this? Let me see. And I'm going to jump and then jump back. When we're in trouble, usually what we do is that's the only time we're desperate enough to go after God in a way where he lets us find him. Uh -huh. Usually our clapping is like, okay, it's church. It ain't clapping like, man, you got 24 hours to leave. You know, usually our singing is, it's church. I will bless the Lord. It ain't, no, no, no. You you just contracted this pandemic and they got to put you on a respirator. And don't know, I don't know if you're going to be able to make it through it. Glory be to God. It's not. And so now what God had to do was put them in a desperate situation because they only knew religion. They only knew how to go through motions. But when you begin to worship God in spirit, you'll look like they're about to put you on a respirator because you're going after God. You'll look like the world is going to end tomorrow. There is a desperation to know him, to hear him, and to touch him that you function in. It quickens you. It wakes you up. And so everybody around you is saying, we need to pray. Man, I've been praying like that all the time. Everybody around you is saying, we need to seek God. We've been doing that the whole time. We've been seeking him like it's been a pandemic because we don't need God to send trouble for us to seek him we worship him in spirit you know what God has to send trouble because we get bored with prayer after 15 minutes and so God has to send some trouble because that's the only time you'll cry in a way in which he will show himself to you. Right now it's just a religious cry. Right now it's just that, okay, my 20 minutes up. Right now it's just a, okay, I'm going to read for my 30 minutes. God, but that, that, that don't access God. That will never access the glory of God. 
That's not what seeking him is. Seeking him isn't organized. Isn't an organized, put it in the box here with the rest of my life. Amen? God doesn't get the glory when we worship him in tragedy. He gets the glory when we worship him in spirit. Do you understand that we've been seeing people worshiping God all over the world because of this pandemic? We could rewind to last year before a pandemic and go to some underground church pictures where they're actually crying out and ripping their clothes for God. In a pandemic, they're still out worshiping the other they're still out worshiping us in a pandemic. They ain't going to die. Ain't nothing going wrong. But they understand worship in spirit. Worship in, in truth. If we believe that God gets glory out of people in a tragedy, worshiping, worshiping him will actually, watch this, spend more time looking for a tragedy than listening to a teacher. You know why we necessitate tragedy? Because we didn't respond to the teacher. The te it's already been taught that God wants adulation. He wants excessive worship. It's already been taught that God wants us to take the borders off. And how we hit and all those things, but we don't listen to the teacher. So guess what? When we don't listen to the teacher, if God loves us, what is he going to allow? A tragedy. A tragedy. Amen. We could, we could enter into the passion through teaching. We don't need a tragedy to passionately seek God and cry out to Him. Come on, we can, we can enter into desperate worship through teaching. We can enter into brokenness through teaching. We can enter into focus on prayer through teaching. We don't, it doesn't demand a tragedy. Amen? Second Chronicles, I'm going to go back here, chapter 15. And I just want to remind you of some things. Y'all bear with me. I'm going to read verse 5 again. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. But great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation, and city of city. For God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak. For your work shall be re re rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. Now watch what he did. He took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and out of the cities which he had taken from the Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon. For they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month and the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep that's a sacrifice right and they entered into a covenant watch this to do what seek the Lord God of their fathers not just seek him with all their heart and with all their soul that whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death whether small or great or whether man or woman and they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with a shouting with trumpets and with cornets. And Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their hearts and sought him with their whole desire. And guess what happened? And he was found of them. And the Lord gave them. What did they just have six or seven verses ago? No peace vexation in and out stress and struggle the only thing that changed between vexation and rest was a word called seeking 
But they said, I'm going to seek them with all my heart. You don't even got to fix the problem to get rest. Me and you don't even have to solve the issue to get rest. Everything don't even have to change in our life to enter into rest. All we have to do is decide to say, I'm going to seek God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And while we're still dealing with this, we're going to rest good. There's going to be joy in our hearts and confidence in the grace of God. The only thing in between us and peace and rest and victory is one thing. Seeking God with all of our heart. All of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. I'm, I'm, I'm going to laser point back on verse number four. But when they in their trouble, but when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and saw him, he was found of them. When they were in their trouble. Amen. We cannot allow trouble to be the only agent for which we get desperate enough to go all out in worship and prayer and, and, and running after God. Amen. I'm going to read this last part. And I'm going to close. Second Chronicles chapter 14. Verse number two. It says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves. And command, now notice how idolatry is connected to seeking. And then commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and his commandment. Verse number three, for he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and broke down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord. Listen to me and listen to me carefully. We got to get this. Where tragedy is necessary for desperate devotion, where it takes a tragedy for us to enter into a necessary measure of desperate devotion where God will actually uh, come and respond to us if, it, if that demands a tragedy idolatry is present where seeking is lacking idols are present what do idols do? they make us idol they might make us idle concerning the things of the kingdom is always moving. Yes. Amen? Where we're not seeking God, there's the presence of alien altars. See, do you understand that phones become altars to strange gods when because of them we've lost our seek? Uh -huh. And where it literally diminishes a desperation to go after him in a way that we can find him? If our phones have diminished our seek to the place where we will not go hard after God because of all the things we got to watch, flip, see, and talk about, then what we got to understand is that phone ain't just a phone to us. That's an idol God. Why iPhone? I, I'm going to leave that alone. There's some stuff that God spoke to me about the iPhone and idolatry. But I, I'm not, we're not even going to deal with that right now. But, but my, my phone is literally the reason why I don't seek God. Television becomes an altar to a strange God when because of it we've lost our seek of God where it diminishes our desperation to go after him in a way where he'll respond to us. Man, if I pray for 15 minutes and I don't get a response, there's a problem. Amen. I don't never plan on praying and not getting a response. Amen. Don't get used to that. Amen. If you praise God and don't get a response, there's a problem. Amen. He's a living God. No son talks to his daddy and his daddy don't talk back to him. I'm not going to ignore my son. When we lift our hands, that's, that's, that's supposed to be a response. When we read the Bible, that's supposed to be a response. When we sing unto God, that's supposed to be a response. And if there's not, it's time to clear out some idols. It, it, but maybe we need to put away some phones and some televisions and some internets and some things because we have now diminished our seat to the point where we've gone without the true and living God for too long and we don't even expect to hear him when we pray. 
We don't even expect to feel them when we worship. Amen? Our social life becomes an altar to a strange God. When because of that social life, we're not active seekers of God. And it diminishes a desperation to go after him in a way where we find him. You know we can't find God. He has to let us. He has to now reveal himself. So it's not about whether or not you're a good detective. It's whether or not how deep you're willing to go in devotion. Because God just has to show you who he is. We can't find him. So he's not waiting to see who's smart enough to find him. He's waiting on who's hot enough so he can reveal himself. I want somebody that wants me. I'm not trying to see if you can find me. I'm trying to see how much you want me. And I'll reveal myself. Amen? All right. I told the fib. I'm going to one more scripture. This is the last one. But I want to go here. And I, 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 I want to help you understand right now. There's some, there's some stuff we have to start recognizing as idolatry. I'm not telling you not to use a phone, but you need to put your phone away long enough where it isn't, where it doesn't have a godly influence over you. I'm not telling, there's nothing wrong with social media, but you need to get off social media long enough where it doesn't have a godly influence, where it doesn't influence my seeking. Amen? I get back on it when I got it under control. Amen? But if I'm praying and I can't hear God, that got to go. Got to go, man. And if I'm worshiping and I don't feel him, I don't know about you, but I can't. I can't deal with that. I can't imagine how Adam felt when he ate from that fruit. You really don't know what you got until you lose it. That man had the glory of God on him. He ate of that fruit and lost it in a moment. It was just something gone that he knew he had. He didn't know what he lost until he realized, I, I don't have it. There's something of God that ain't on me no more. I can't imagine going into sin and, and not waking up not being able to hear God's voice. I've been doing this for too many years. I can't imagine. I, I function uh, uh, through the Spirit of God. I, I think by the Spirit of God. I, I, what I want in my drive is by the Spirit. I can, what would I do if I woke up and prayed and didn't hear Him? I don't know about you, but I couldn't take it. What would I do if I read this Bible and walked away and I didn't hear nothing? I couldn't take it. I got to walk with the living God. Amen? And if I had to go off in a cardboard box with, a, with, some, <laughs> with no electric to get his voice back, I'll do it. Amen. Amen. Psalms 34, verse number 10. Watch this. Psalms 34, verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Those that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Those that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. When we, me and you, are seekers of God, God gives us good before we can have a chance to warn I, I, I want you to really catch that scripture. Those that he didn't say that those, he won't, God will literally, when we begin to seek him, he'll, before we can want it, he'll give it to us so we can have it because he don't want us to want for anything when we say yes to seeking him. In other words, when we're really seekers of God, we don't want it to get it. We seek him and he gives it to us before we can want it. When we have a ton of wants, then we have a, 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 a we have a, 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 a broken seat. If, when we're walking around saying, God, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, you missed it. No, 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 no. Those that actually seek after God shall not want. In other words, I get the one want right. The one, one thing that I desire, and that will I seek after, that, that I may interact with and commune with God as vine to branch. And when that becomes the dominant want, before I can want anything else, he'll beat me to it because he gives me the prize because that's the bullseye. Seeking God. 
Seeking God puts us in a position where he won't let us want it before he gives it to us. Do you understand that God knows what we're going to want next month? He knows what we're going to want next year. He knows what we're going to and, and when we begin to seek him for real, he won't even wait till next year. He said, I'm going to give you what you don't even know you want yet this year. Because I'm, I'm going to beat you to the punch. I'm not going to let you want it before I give it to you. I'm not going to let you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into 2030. And I'm going to start bringing things that you're going to want into 2030. Back into 2020. Because of those that seek me shall not want for any good. I'm not going to let you want it before I give it to you. You'll find that people who walk with God and you talk to them. You know what they'll tell you? I really don't want too much of nothing. I'm good. It ain't too much I want. Let's be seek God. We can't be in want when we're in a posture of sin. Family, the Lord again is calling us to unbridled worship adoration worship in spirit that gives us access into truth the truth is God always causes us to triumph how do I get in there the truth is we never grow weary how do I get in there the truth is depression is not a part of our life one day of our life how do I get in there worship in spirit that gives us access into truth. I want to place that in remembrance. I know I preached it. I know I taught it. But I want to stir you back into that thing. Even on this evening. And I just want to pray for us as a people. I'm going to pray for us as a people because God does not. God is bringing us to a place where we're not. We're not going to be here learning truth. We're going to be walking truth. We're going to be demonstrating truth in the earth realm. We're not going to be saying the saints are supposed to be healing. We're going to be healing. We're not going to say the saints are supposed to have power. We're going to have it. We're not going to be saying that we're supposed to be victorious. We're going to be victorious. We're going to be it instead of saying what we're supposed to be. We're going to be in truth. But I'm telling you right now, there's a commitment to worship. There's a commitment to, there's some new borders and boundaries that the Lord is calling us out of in our worship expression that's going to seem unreasonable to the reasonable mind where you literally bless him at all times and you seek him beyond borders and you reprioritize your life to go after God. Hallelujah. This worship, if we're going to worship in spirit, our life is not going to look like the lives of, of, of normal people. I'm telling you right now. Worship that gets us in the truth. Our life won't look like the life of other people. Most people you know, your life will not look like when you begin worshiping in spirit. In a spirit that gets you inside of truth. Everybody's standing to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. I'm done.